When I was preparing for baptism at 16 years of age, there was uh, classes, of course, that I attended. And I remember my pastor's wife who led the classes using this phrase, you were saved to serve, not sit and sour. You were saved to serve, not sit and sour. And uh, I, I always attributed that quotation to her, but as it turns out, she uh, actually borrowed it from the uh, British American women's leader and pastor's wife, Jill Briscoe, uh, who first coined that phrase, I guess. You were saved to serve, not sit and sour. And today and next Sunday, we're going to look at how that gets worked out, the importance of serving in the local church as we look at Jesus' role as a servant through the words of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. So I hope you'll stick around for that. I want to wish you a warm welcome, you who are gathered here in person and you who are gathered online. We're glad that you all are here today. And uh, there's opportunities for uh, us to gather for coffee after worship. Go to the right after uh, you leave the worship space into the gym. And for you online, you'll have to make your own coffee, but we'd love to have you participate in the chat online or hit like, subscribe, notification, all those things so that we can keep in touch with each other. And everybody's able to make use of the connection card at stpaulsnobleden.ca slash connect. A few things to remind you of. Mike could still use some help in the booth, so if you'd like to get some learning in technology and help out with the ministry that gets broadcast all over the world, quite literally then please uh, see Mike in the booth, which is to the left of, as you leave the worship space uh, today. Uh, there may yet be some more snow this winter, so the snow shoveling schedule is on the bulletin board or on the, the easel out in the lobby, and we would be glad for a little bit more help in that regard. So if you can take a week, uh, I understand May is already taken, but there are uh, a few other weeks that you can participate. And we'd love to have you greet at the door if you'd like to do that. And Linda Blydorp, who probably did greet you at the door this morning, uh, would be pleased to hear from you if you'd like to help with that. The contemporary hymn writer Jane Parker Huber wrote these words, Called as partners in Christ's service, called to ministries of grace, we respond with deep commitment, fresh new lines of faith to trace. May we learn the art of sharing side by side and friend with friend, equal partners in our caring to fulfill God's chosen end. Let's worship the Lord together. Please stand.
reading this morning is from the letter to the church at Philippi, so Philippians chapter 2, and we'll read verses 1 to 11. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, 
every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Thanks, Allison. I just want to take a second here as we uh, consider the Lord's offering because uh, apparently some folks are asking why every week we have to list off all these different ways that you can give. And so I thought I'd tell you why we do it. In Christendom, back when everybody was assumed to have a Christian memory in this country, the preacher could just get up and say, the Lord's offering will be received. And the plates would fill up just out of duty or custom or because people wanted to worship the Lord that way. Today, that is not so true. In fact, in healthy churches, people give when they can and how they can, and it's the church's job to make that process as easy as possible for all who join us in worship, whether in person or online. Our treasurer tells me that almost 40% of our total gifts last year were given through electronic funds transfer, which is a free and easy way to honor God with our gifts, and so as a result, we want to encourage that method of giving, which is so simple. Or let's say somebody was perusing the website, and they liked what they saw, and they decided they'd like to make a contribution toward what God is doing among us here. And for the website, we offer PayPal, which while not free uh, to us, it does give the potential donor more than one option to make it easy to give. And we still have some folks who are worshiping at home online, hi there, and uh, for them, writing a check is just probably the easiest thing that they can do, and they can send it through the mail. For many years, we've offered pre-authorized remittance, allowing your gift to come once a month out of your bank account, kind of like your mortgage payment does. It costs about 50, 50 cents a transaction, which is cheap, and yet we only have a small handful of people who participate in this. Diana and I are among them, but it is a simple option. And of course, the offering plate is left in the lobby with envelopes that you can use to get credit like you do with all of these methods uh, for the convenience of you who are in the room who have not given by one of the other means. The goal is to make it easy for you to give and for the sake of guests in the room, and we do have some welcome, uh, and those of you who are online that may be joining us for the first or not necessarily the multiple of, multiple of, let's make that a word today, time, uh, It serves as a helpful bit of information to help you know that there are options available uh, as we seek to worship God with our gifts. So that's why we continue to remind folks week after week of the different ways to give. And by whatever means we give, we honor God and praise Him with more than just our minds and our mouths. Thank you for your ongoing generosity toward the mission of God through St. Paul's. Allison's going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you for all the ways that you bless us, for the resources that you give us. Thank you for all of those who worship by giving back to you that small portion of what you've given to them. Lord, help us to use all those gifts wisely and for your glory, and so that others will know the love of Jesus. Father, we thank you that Jesus did come and and gave up his divine privileges, and he came to humanity so that we can be forgiven and restored into relationship with you. Thank you that because we belong to Christ, we have encouragement and comfort and the fellowship and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you will give us tender hearts, that you will fill us with your compassion. We pray for the unity of your universal church, and we pray for the unity of this congregation. Help us to love one another and work together to live out this good news of Jesus. Help us to be an example of the gospel and to share the love of Jesus with our neighbors and our communities. 
Lord, we confess that we often fail to be the people you've called us to be. Forgive us for the times we've been selfish. Help us to be humble and to think of other people's needs. Help us to look after the interests of the most vulnerable people in our community. We pray for our neighbors who are struggling with food insecurity. Provide food, but also, God, provide good health and secure employment. We thank you for the work of the King Township Food Bank. Thank you for the Love Bags Ministry here at St. Paul's. Bless those who are providing help and who are serving you by serving others. God, we pray this morning for our, our family members and friends who need a healing touch from you today. Strengthen their bodies. Give them rest and comfort and encouragement. Work through us. Show us ways that we can support them and care for them. Father, we lift up to you all the students and the teachers who are enjoying March break this week. We pray that this will be a week of fun and rest and that they will enjoy time with family. Be with those especially who are traveling and keep them safe, we pray. Thank you for this time of worship, for the joy of being with brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for those who join with us online. We pray that they will feel supported and connected to our congregation. Thank you for opportunities you give all of us to grow as disciples of Jesus. Thank you for our Life Connect groups. Bless them as they study your word this week and pray for one another and support each other and, and do life in Christ together. And now bless us as we all turn to your word and open our hearts and minds as we read scripture. Guide us by your Holy Spirit so that we hear your message today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you scan the internet, you might come to the conclusion that the most precious commodity in the world is money. True, it's pretty hard to get by in most countries without at least a few nickels to rub together. I say nickels because in this country we don't have pennies to rub together anymore. In fact, for, for waiting down freight cars on my model railroad, I may actually have a corner on the penny collection in this country. So if uh, you need some, hit me up. Uh, at any rate, uh, despite our consumer economy, the most precious commodity is not money. But if you took some time to scan the internet a little longer, you might find some human interest stories and then come to the correct conclusion that indeed the most precious commodity in the world is actually time. And ironically, <laughs> many people use a lot of the world's most precious commodity looking up things on the internet. <laughs> No matter how hard we work, no matter how much we earn, we all have exactly the same amount of time in every day. 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, 86,400 seconds. And despite all the innovations of science and research, the day is still just 24 hours long. The only reprieve we get from this is in leap year when February 29th gets to shine, making up for those few extra seconds that uh, tick along each day since the earth does not orbit the sun in exactly 365 days. And adding a day once every four years is easier than adding a few minutes uh, in periodic intervals. Uh, it just makes the world less chaotic and more simple. Time. Rich or poor, old or young, everybody has exactly the same amount of it every day. Question becomes, what do we do with our time? When I teach about the value of personal devotional time with the Lord as a daily discipline, the commonest excuse I hear, and you can predict this, is, I don't have time. 
But you know what? You actually do have enough time. The issue isn't time. The issue is priorities. In simpler times when there was no Canada's wonderland, no internet, little or no television, boy, how old do you have to be to remember that? It was easier to find time for God. But now we have all these shiny baubles that capture our attention uh, and God and his work get shuffled off to the periphery. One of the ways that we see this reality lived out in the local church is through engagement in service. Finding volunteers to serve has been increasingly challenging over the last 25 or 30 years, and this was really ramped up through the pandemic. But it doesn't have to be that way. We simply need to take some of our most precious commodity, time, and figure out how best to prioritize our time in a way that will benefit individuals, households, and the community. Obviously, there are commitments that can't be broken. If we're employed, we go to work because whether we like our job or not, it keeps us housed and fed. We maintain our homes and our vehicles because if we don't, uh, they will no longer properly uh, keep us housed or transport us. We spend time with our loved ones because that's a key way to express our love and for them to express their love to us. And we sleep. Believe it or not, we sleep. Maybe not last night, or at least not as much last night. But we sleep because, well, our bodies are not designed for 24-7 engagement. But let's say that all takes up, say, 120 of the week's 168 hours. What are we doing with the rest of it? Well, some people are spending an inordinate amount of time commuting to and from work. This too, of course, is an issue of priorities because you get to pick where you live, you get to pick where you work, and so often folks who pick where they live as a long way from where they work do so because they end up being able to get more house for the money, and then ironically, because they're spending so much time commuting, they don't get to spend as much time in the house. Some are spending an inordinate amount of time glued to their devices, You'll cut me a break for doing that right here, right? Whether it's the endless scroll of social media or the endless episodes on Netflix, some people are also spending an inordinate amount of time working. Especially during the pandemic, the boundaries between work and home really got blurred, and it's not uncommon for people to work at strange hours or even on days off. You get the idea. I don't need to go on beyond that, because you can draw between the dots. But in society, how we prioritize our time is a real issue, even for followers of Jesus. And the church feels it when it doesn't have all the volunteers it needs. Oh, sure. The church can definitely do a better job at stewarding its volunteers and ensuring people are asked appropriately. Uh, people should be serving according to their spiritual gifts, their natural talents, and their acquired skills. You want to know more about that? Let me know, because uh, I can always put on another spiritual gifts seminar. My hobby horse saddle is soft and waiting for me to ride. Uh, and, of course, the church should know what are our natural talents and acquired skills and spiritual gifts so that we can tap people on the shoulder, the right people, and not just put out cattle calls like we tend to do. But getting back to devotional time priority, if we took more time to, to spend with the Lord, both speaking and listening, we might be more attentive to the nudge of the Holy Spirit and serve in some particular way in the body of Christ. I told you before, I'm convinced every local church has all the requisite gifts and talents and skills needed to do the ministry to which God is calling that local church within the body of that local church. We just need to figure that out for ourselves and then get at it. I want to take a couple of Sundays with you to think about serving. It's not a guilt trip, but, you know, if the Holy Spirit says, then please do pay attention to that nudge. Instead, I want to look at serving from a prophetic standpoint. We all know that Jesus was the model servant. But did you know that his role as a model servant was actually prophesied in the Old Testament hundreds of years before Jesus was born in that hewn-out cave in Bethlehem? 
We're going to spend today and next week looking at a couple of passages from the prophet Isaiah. And the passages we're going to read are commonly read in this the season of Lent because they are passages that prophesy Jesus as the suffering servant, the one who went to the cross for us. But I want to look at them not from the fact that they point to the cross, which is true, but as they point to servanthood that we can emulate. First of those passages we're going to look at is from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 7. It's all kinds of argument among scholars as to the setting of Isaiah 42, but it's likely a prophecy that either is set in or foretold the exile of God's people in Babylon in the 6th century B.C. People are far away from their land, their land with which they identified so much, and they want to go back. Nobody likes living in exile under oppression. Sometimes they'd go looking to other gods for help. But they quickly found out, as you could read in chapter 41, that none of those idols were of any help to them. And sometimes they'd yearn to have a king who would be even nastier and crueler than the kings that were oppressing them, so that they could return to their land, if by no other means than force. But despite their protests and attempts to take matters in their own hands, God has a radically different answer. They wanted a fierce ruler. And what did God say they were going to get? A child in chapter 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. They're looking for somebody who's going to smite the nations, and God is sending them a child. They wanted an uncompromising king, and instead God is going to offer them a servant who takes on cruelty and oppression and gives back love. This is Isaiah 42, 1 to 7. Look at my servant whom I strengthen. Now literally, this is his servant whom God grips fast. That's the the term strengthen there kind of means hold on to. You know, God is keeping the servant as his own. He is my chosen one who pleases me. I have put my spirit upon him. A prophecy we see fulfilled in John chapter 1 when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. He will bring justice to the nations. Now, justice is a very popular term these days. But its meaning has really become blurred over time. And human justice and divine justice don't often look the same. The word that's translated justice here in Isaiah 42 refers to order. That is the opposite of chaos. The people in exile, in terms of the original intent, the people in exile would be freed by the establishment of God's order through King Cyrus of Persia, who overthrew King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and would allow the people of Judah to then return to their land. So in that sense, Cyrus was God's servant, but this points to something greater that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Verse 2. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. The servant will not shout a battle cry or yell out in pain, but will be gentle and humble. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Now, at the time of Isaiah, that weak reed, that flickering candle, was the people of God themselves. But the servant would not break that reed or snuff out that candle. The servant will mend that which is broken and return life to that which was fading. God's own people could not do this on their own, so that one had to stand in to do that what they could do not do what they could not do for themselves he will bring justice to all who have been wronged he will not falter or lose heart that is literally he will not bruise easily until justice prevails through the earth even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction god the lord created the heavens and stretched them out he created the earth and everything in it He gives breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth. And it is he who says, I, the Lord, have called you, the servant, to demonstrate my righteousness. 
I will take you by the hand and guard you, preserve you. I will give you to my people Israel as a servant, as a symbol of my covenant with them. That is, the servant will become the covenant. And you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. Now, as I read that passage, it was the first part of verse 6 that really stood out for me. I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. So if we see the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 42 as the Lord Jesus, as our model, he helps us understand that we serve God to show God. We serve God to show God. What we see in Isaiah 42 is a prediction of the ministry of Christ. He came to restore God's right order in the world. Like the the cross isn't just about salvation from sin, as important as that is. It's also about restoring humanity from the effects of sin. He came to take his teaching to the ends of the earth, as he said in the Great Commission to his disciples. You know, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and so forth. He carried on, they carried on the ministry of Jesus with Jesus as their model. And he did all this from a position of weakness. I mean, how countercultural can you get? Jesus didn't serve to gain power. He was the suffering servant, the holy God, who had all the power of the Father at his hand, yet he became a servant, washing feet, living simply, teaching truth, and submitting to the most heinous form of punishment known to the human race at the time. He could have lived like a king. He could have run the Romans out of town. But he came as a servant. His greatest passion was not power, but the glory of God. Do you see how this serves as a model for us to serve God, to show God? Let me break it down for you. First, as it says in verse 1, he is the Lord's servant. Look at my servant, it says, whom I strengthen. The servant, the Lord Jesus, is God's servant for God's task. When we're we're young, people ask us, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And some of us have a pretty good idea, you know, from a very early age, what we want to do. You know, uh, when I was very young, I wanted to be a truck driver, just like my uncle. Because in that, you got to be in this big rig, and there were all kinds of buttons to push and pull not least the air horn, everybody's favorite. Well, then by middle school, I took an interest in the weather and decided I wanted to be a meteorological physicist and uh, tell the TV weatherman what to say. And I began undergraduate studies in physics, and the Lord called me into full-time Christian service from there, and I never looked back. But had I become a meteorologist... I would have been the best meteorologist I could have been, but I also would have served Christ in the church. You don't have to be a pastor to serve the Lord. You just have to follow Jesus and have a willing heart, learning your gifts and serving appropriately. And if you serve the Lord, He will strengthen you. He will give you His Holy Spirit, and you will play your role in bringing justice, order out of chaos, We serve God to show God. Second, notice in verse 2 that the servant is not self-assertive. It says, he will not shout or raise his voice in public. We need to be wary of people who clamor for leadership positions in the church, or worse, try to pull strings from the background in some sort of passive-aggressive manner. The church, like any other gathered group, is going to have its share of challenges that come with being a diverse group of people trying to be united around one mission. But the church, unlike any other gathered group, has but one mission and one Lord of that mission, and we should be submissive to Him, not trying to push our own agendas. It's one of the reasons I love presbyterial polity. We elect ruling elders whom we believe have the requisite gifts and skills and talents to lead us prayerfully, and we trust that the leadership will work together with the pastor in executing God's mission in the community. The session, by definition, is primarily a body that deliberates and discerns the will of God, and sometimes it has to do so amid the noise of many agendas. 
But the leadership is committed to but one agenda, and that is the one that the Lord lays before us. We're called to serve, not in a self-assertive way, but often in quiet ways, uh, even when those quiet ways involve very upfront kinds of activities. Sometimes that means stepping out of our comfort zones, trying new things that may be more upfront than we are used to. But if God has given us the gift to serve in that way, he will, uh, in every way, give us everything we need to make that happen. Sometimes it means stepping out of our comfort zones to try something that isn't necessarily up front, but maybe something we've never tried before, uh, such as the technology part of it uh, with getting these wonderful pictures up on the screens and getting our service broadcast on the internet and that sort of thing. Serving without self-assertion is often demonstrated best in congregational meetings. I often say to people, you want to see the true nature of a local church, go to their annual meeting. Then you find out where the agendas really are and what is the true character of the people. Now, our congregational meetings are usually filled with gratitude and thoughtful discernment. I have seen some other church meetings where there is no sense that anyone is living like a servant. Be a servant who is not self-assertive. We serve God to show God. Third, as it tells us in verse 3, servants are menders, not breakers. Well, the people of God in exile were looking for a king who would be more brutal than their captors, what the Lord would send them was a servant who wouldn't crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. This is so countercultural as to seem laughable. But if you look at churches where growth is happening and people are being reached for Jesus, what you see in the people and especially in the leaders is meekness. Our society tends to equate meek with weak. But really, meekness is just humility. It's not weakness at all. It's a strength. Remember what Allison read for us in Philippians chapter 2? Jesus conquered the world by being a humble servant. And that's the model we're to follow. It's not about power. It's not about who gets the most votes. It's about relying on the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the humble people who serve God to show God in the local church and in the community. Our role is not to break or tear down, but to mend. And that involves the next point. We mend as we serve in establishing justice. Verses 1, 3, and 4 all talk about justice defined as establishing order out of chaos. And this differs a lot from society's view of justice, which nowadays tends to be setting special privileges for the loudest lobby group. There are churches that give themselves entirely to this secular definition of justice, but the church of Jesus is called to give itself to the establishment of God's justice, and that means taking the chaos that exists in society and ordering it correctly according to the way the Scripture established it. Our laws are largely based on the values of Scripture, and these are being torn down because people seem to think that they know better than the Lord does but his servants are called to speak clearly and humbly in favor of divine justice so that the world's order is properly established. Let me color that in a bit for you. Our role as God's servants is to do all we can to bring God's order to our chaotic world, and that involves humble but persistent advocacy for the principles of Scripture in the gospel in areas like life over death whether of the unborn or of the elderly or the gravely ill. Faithful sexual ethics established at creation. Environmental stewardship because the earth is the Lord's and he has called us to take care of it. Financial stewardship because the glory of God is more important than the glorification of our desires and so on. So the Lord's servant is not self-assertive, mends rather than breaks and establishes God's justice in the world. Now, The servant also demonstrates righteousness. Verse 6 says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. This is our modus operandi, our reason for being. The Westminster Shorter Catechism reminds us in its first question and answer that the chief end of the human race is to glorify God 
and enjoy him forever. Which is also very countercultural when you consider that in the world we're largely called to glorify ourselves and enjoy ourselves forever. Here's a litmus test for you. Anytime you go to do something, ask yourself, is God glorified in this? If the answer is yes, then do it. If the answer is no, don't do it. Easier said than done, I know, but give it a try this week. If you're a servant of the Lord or you want to be a servant of the Lord, ask yourself if what you're doing gives glory to the Lord. Now, this will vary by culture in a local congregation. But you may be surprised at the latitude of things that you can do that give glory to God. Uh, simply by the attitude with which we undertake them or the measure with which we undertake them. So, for example, great controversy. Can you have a drink to the glory of God? Well, in many places, yes, you can. Can you drink to excess to the glory of God? No, because the Bible says that drunkenness is not something we should participate in. Can you go out on a date to the glory of God? Yes, you can. Can you engage in sexual relations with someone who is not your spouse? No, you can't. The Bible is pretty clear, but sexual relations being reserved for the marriage between a man and a woman. You can come up with other examples of your own, but the idea is that we demonstrate God's righteousness by ensuring that we live and serve for his glory alone. The Lord's servant is not self-assertive. He mends rather than breaks. He establishes God's justice and demonstrates God's righteousness. All because we serve to show. God. Finally, we see in verse 6 that the servant would be a symbol of God's covenant with his people. In fact, Jesus, in fulfilling this prophecy, actually became the new covenant. Our role is to be signs of God's covenant. I often tell couples when they get married, no pressure, but people should be able to look at you and say, that's what the love of God looks like. It's a high ideal, and we don't always live up to it, but our goal should be to love one another so that the world sees and says, yes, this is the love of God. Same can be said for the church, by the way. The world should be able to look at the church and say, ah, see how they love one another. This is what the love of God looks like. And that's how all this circles back, because servants love their self-assertion is set aside because of love. They mend instead of breaking because of love. And they establish God's justice and demonstrate God's righteousness because of love. But we can't separate these one from the other. God's love and God's justice are two sides of the same coin. A lot of people try to separate them. They say God's love trumps justice or God, you know, but that's not the case. That's why loving with God's love can sometimes be difficult because justice makes certain demands of us that the world has decided are unloving. But we can't be controlled by the world's definition of anything. We answer to the Lord as his servants. Sometimes God's love can seem tough, but it is still the ultimate form of love. We serve God to show God, and by serving God, we serve others. So how are you serving God right now? What could you be doing to reorder your priorities with time so that you are putting your faith to work in a practical manner? The bulk of our ministry happens through a series of teams that meet regularly or irregularly. Very often they meet as, an, as required. Uh, to undertake the mission of God in this community. So I'm going to give you the list of the teams just to give you an overview, and, and you can maybe prayerfully consider whether God might be uh, nudging you toward one of these. The, there's one that's called the worship and music team. Uh, you can offer your musical skills if you have some. Uh, if you don't have some, let's find another team for you. Uh, 
but you can offer your musical skills in God's praise as part of our team. The kids and family ministry team, you could serve God by serving children in Junction Ministries or in First Link, our kids ministry program and our nursery. There's also outreach where you could look for relevant ways to present the gospel to our ever-changing community. Or mission, championing the cause of God's work in other places, possibly even participating in a mission trip abroad. The leading with care team, which helps you serve by ensuring that the young and the vulnerable are protected when they are under our care. The stewardship team, which helps you Uh, serve by giving sacrificially and encouraging others to do the same. The board of managers, which enables you to serve by helping with the upkeep of the physical plant, which uh, as a building ages becomes more and more important. Or the congregational life team, uh, which you can serve by helping find ways to get God's people together through fellowship and community. And I'm happy to put you in touch with the people who oversee these ministries Uh, if you felt a little nudge from the Lord to serve. You you can also serve, by the way, connection cards, stpaulsnobleland.ca slash connect, that's how you do that. Uh, You can just talk to me. Uh, You can serve your neighbors too outside of the church. Not all of our service for God's kingdom happens in the building or even around the building. Sometimes it happens in the neighborhood. Check in on your elderly neighbors, maybe shovel their snow, invite a bereaved neighbor for dinner, do anything that would help your neighbor and do it as an act of service to the glory of God. We serve God to show God whether within the church or outside the church. We all have the same amount of time each day, each week, each year. So talk to God and discern how you will prioritize your time so that God gets the glory and his kingdom grows. Let's pray. Father, thank you for calling us to service in your kingdom through your church. We pray that you will give us grace to prioritize our time so that we're able to serve using our gifts to show your glory. Keep us, Father, from being religious consumers, just as Jesus came not to be served but to serve. Help us to follow in his footsteps, that all of us will do our part to be the body of Christ in this community, in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'd like to accept the challenge to serve, whether you're here in the room or online, you can use the connection card. It's in paulsnobleton.ca slash connect. And I will be pleased to help you find an area of gifting to serve God so you can show God. Please stand as we praise. Sister, let me serve. 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you too, as you serve him, may soar like eagles. Go in his grace. Go in his mercy. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.